Hold on on tight tight for the the next next hour. hour. You're entering entering into a place, a zone zone called called the alternative to the alternative media. It's a place, a special place, where even truth seekers fear to tread. All right, people, let's move like we've got a purpose. Affirmative. Okay, Greg Anthony here, and glad you're back on the Investigative Journal on this Monday, April 24th, 2017, day on our calendar. And uh, two things I want to talk about today. One, I think the Bible warns us that George Washington's family crest is a sign of Babylon and the mark of the beast. Why would he do that? We're going to explore that today. And also today, President Trump made a phone call to the fictitious... International Space Station and implored that all school children listen to the conversation. Now, it doesn't get any better than this when it comes to deception because we're going to look at the fact today that there is no International Space Station. It's right here on Earth. It takes place in an airplane. Maybe they fly somewhere, but it's very interesting when you really look at it. So we're going to get into that today too. So, Back to my first discussion uh, regarding George Washington. And uh, those who deny this, George Washington connections to the Jesuits, aren't really keeping their minds open about really what happened during the American Revolution. Now, the point is, even Jesuit critics point out that there is Jesuit infiltration in America. But when did this occur? Did it occur in uh, 1825? Did it occur during the Civil War? Did it occur during uh, when? Uh, Was it during Teddy Roosevelt's administration? Was it during John F. Kennedy? So when did it occur? I contend that facts will show that it occurred long before this country was even formed and that the Vatican and the Jesuits were instrumental in creating the and providing the strategy for the Revolutionary War, and that many of the original founding fathers were working with them, either willingly or unwillingly. And uh, that's important. Definitely, uh, you have to say that Washington and uh, Ben Franklin were willing Vaticanites. And uh, this really stirs up a lot of people. And in fact, when I first started talking about this, Over a decade ago, people said that, uh, boy, Greg is talking against the Constitution and the Founding Fathers. No, I was just starting to ask people to look at another side of the story that never gets uh, published or even put in our history books. And there is facts that lead us to believe that what I'm telling you should be on the table of discussion. One, uh, a Charles Thompson, who was perhaps our most, uh, he was basically uh, transcribing all of the events around the formation of our country at the Continental Congress during the Declaration of Independence, etc., etc., the Constitution. And he was the recorder of everything, the man behind the scenes who knew the real truth. Now, after uh, the country was on its way and the Constitution was put in place, he retired to his family home and began writing his memoirs. He was also a um, historian and a translator of uh, the Bible into many different languages. So a brilliant man, both um, astute in the biblical and political uh, worlds during his time. Now, when confronted with this question, was there a secret agenda in a sense regarding the creation of America? He refused to answer, but his question, his his answers were so revealing, even though he didn't directly uh, provide a number of facts. Those were in his memoirs that somehow have been either uh, misplaced, I believe, hidden by the powers that be. I think they could either be in the Vatican Library and some Masonic Lodge, which really tell us 
really the connection between our found, many of our founding fathers and the Jesuits in the Vatican. In order to create a hidden agenda, the, the, the plan was very simple, I think, if we look at it. Create a country where freedom of religion and speech are allowed. Infiltrate that country with a religion that was persona non grata, religious uh, the Catholics were not allowed here because of what they were doing in Europe. This opened the door so they could grow. And who has benefited more over the years? From one small diocese outside of Washington, D.C. to today, perhaps the most influential. In fact, I'm looking right now at um, a conversation going on between a Catholic priest on Fox News regarding President Trump is going to meet with the Pope. And what is he going to speak about? They were talking earlier how they were at odds. Now they're going to meet in Rome when he goes to Italy for the G7 uh, uh, summit in Sicily. Well, I tell you, I know what they're going to talk about. They're going to talk about the Luciferian New World Order agenda and how they can push it forward so that Rome, again, has control of the world through their minions, him being one. That's what they're going to talk about. And uh, they'll have a nice little satanic conversation together because that is the seat of Satan. And, you know, that brings to mind something, and I'll get to George Washington in a minute, because we have a full hour today. But uh, I've been doing, you know, I've always explored every possible deception in the world. I remember when I first started doing stories regarding the moon landing was a hoax. Oh, so many people came out and said, Greg, you're going to ruin your reputation. No one's going to believe you about anything. And I said, listen, when I first started covering the Vatican, no one believed anything I said then. Why should that change now? And the point is, you can't piggyback one story on another. You have to take each story on its own. One doesn't relate to the other. And who, you know, I have all these critics, especially a few that are emailing me now saying, you're losing credibility talking about the flat earth. And then they give me all this stuff that the earth is rotating and everything NASA says is true. And, you know, to me, I look at that and go, give me a break. Why would you be worried about my credibility? You know, what they're trying to do is put in the minds of people that if someone tries to present facts that are so out of the mainstream, so basically uh, considered to be, wow, how can anybody say that? It has to be a globe. Come on, Greg. Anything else you say is going to be, uh, you're going to have less credibility. Well, that's untrue. You know something? I have a law degree. I went to law school. Now, does that mean that I am basically in the pocket of the bar? in the pocket of the Jesuits just because I studied their law? No. By studying their law, I see exactly how they control this country. And so by studying NASA and making the blanket statement first that we never went to the moon landing based on facts and said this, just put the facts on the table and let people decide, that doesn't mean it had anything to do with my law studies. And it also doesn't have anything to do with my spiritual studies or who I talk about when I talk about freedom of religion has been taken away. So don't fall for these people who try to do that. They do it all the time. I remember I did a story years ago on the, uh, there was a guy named Charles Hall. And there's all this talk about alien agendas and everything like that. So I put my... Uh, dip my hand in the alien waters and look for one story that I think would people would want to listen and through that story you you may see how big of a hoax it really is but at the time if you don't give these people a forum or you don't discuss it and you ignore it how can you really understand so I interviewed Charles Hall and the tall whites and I interviewed him several times and he was this military balloon. Um, he used to do weather. Uh, he was in, in, in White Sands uh, this during the 60s. He was a weather station man uh, on White Sands, and he would send up weather balloons. And he had this incredible story about the tall whites. Now, I discussed later, after I did that story, people that 
criticized me for talking about the moon landing and the flat earth, did the same thing back then. They said, oh, look at Greg. He's doing a story about aliens. You can't trust him about anything. And it was the same shills, the same people that try to lay doubt. And all I say is this. What, if you don't look into a story, how can you know the facts of anything? And if you totally discount it, like people who totally discount, George Washington may have been in the pocket of the Jesuits. And there are certain signs and symbols that show that. So, with that in mind, let's get to that before I run out of time. I think you get my point about why I cover certain stories to bring facts out. Now, I think I have some people that are on my side as far as um, the, sh the, the movement of the earth. Nikola Tesla is a good example. People criticize, hey, look what they did to him. <laughs> and uh, how many people follow this crazy Einstein theory now? It's ridiculous when you really look at it. And all I'm saying is if you do follow the Einstein theory, you're going to do everything possible to back it up no matter what. And if you follow Tesla, and you're going to do everything to back him up. I fall in the middle of all of it. I just want to know what both groups are thinking. And then maybe I can get an understanding of my own, which basically my, my, my thoughts on it are, re are relatively useless. I'm just presenting the information. And I find that people really have a hard time breaking away from their, uh, you know, it's this kind of I have to be right theory. But anyway, you can't be right unless you're wrong sometimes, right? Think about that. And think about the many things when it comes to being fooled. It's easier to fool people than to try to prove to people that they've been fooled. And I want you to think about who said that, and I'll tell you later. But those who deny Washington's connection to the Jesuits and being involved with this hidden Luciferian New World Order agenda need to read. Uh, the, there's an article reprinted below from a Catholic publication that I'm going to read to you. But before I do that, let's talk about those critics need to also examine the Washington family crest which Washington displayed proudly in his uniform during the American Revolution. It is the contention of some researchers who consider Washington nothing more than a shill in the pocket of the Jesuits, pushing this agenda uh, that we talk about here, this open-door policy to allow all religions in, and guess who benefited the most? The religion that wasn't allowed in, that was Catholicism. Now, uh, what happened here is, I believe that Jesuit General Lorenzo Ricci at the time, now the history books will say he's dead, I don't believe so, and Bishop Landbear and John Carroll uh, were working together with Washington and others to push this hidden agenda and do, and basically these guys were doing their dirty work. Now Washington's family crest is quite revealing and really shows his true colors and signs and symbols are important now to the occult. Don't we agree? Does his crest reveal his hidden agenda was tied together with the very group I'm talking about, the Vatican and the Jesuits? But let's look at the Bible and the book of Daniel. And could that be a confirming authority? And in Daniel 7, 4, it says the first was like a lion and had eagle's wings, talking about the beasts, I think. I beheld till the wings there, thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. This, um, in a sense, refers to the Babylonian Empire, which reigned supreme in Daniel's time. Now, Washington's family crest, remarkably, is what Daniel warned us about. Now, as explained in Washington's memorial website, here is a description of the crest now imprinted on Washington's artifacts, such as fine china plates sold for profit to the public still to this day. George Washington's family crest features a griffin. It's a mythical beast with head and wings of an eagle and the body of a lion. The crest was part of Washington's family's full coat of arms. Washington used the crest on his silver throughout his life. 
This crest, the crest, was also cast into four iron firebacks that Washington purchased in Philadelphia in 1787. Interesting. Now, why would he have that there? Uh, interesting. Uh, now, when I wrote this story and presented this, there were a number of uh, researchers who came to uh, understand and said, yeah, this interpretation sounds remarkably similar to what Daniel prophesied. Others disagree, one being Eric John Phelps, and I thought that was quite interesting because he was one of the biggest Jesuit critics I'd ever met. And he simply said this, to be fair. He said, Babylon has nothing to do with Washington's family crest any more than the lion of the tribe of Judah had as any relation to Babylon. Now, what I'm saying is I don't like to, to disagree. When you disagree with somebody, why just use a simple analogy? Give me a fact. Why would he use that? He would. My, my thinking is this. If I was in his position... I would try to wipe out any kind of relationship to the beast, correct? And so even if that was my family crest, I'd want to denounce it and at least talk about it. But that's never done. So I tend to think that he was one of them, simply put. Now, going, we can go through and, you know, one-third of the Bible is prophecy. And uh, that's told to me by sincere, serious Bible readers. So prophecy is something that's given to us from God, correct? And uh, so if he says, believe in my word, we must believe that he's giving us some signs of what's to come. Now you can go, uh, <clears throat> go through the description of the beast in the New Testament book of Revelations. And you can do that yourself. I'm not going to go through it now. And there's a lot of interpretations used in the Bible prophecy has not been left to human guesswork. Prophecy is God's history written in advance, and the book of Daniel also provides the key to understanding it. So you have a chore. you got to go through these and try to make sense of it, of what's going on today. And you can do that by... Uh, going and starting your own research on all of what I just spoke about. But anyway, instead of going through that lesson today, as I do not have time, I'd like to go to an article which backs up what I was saying about Washington's connections and his possible conversion to Catholicism before his death. Now, this was written, uh, the following article article taken from a Catholic website and forum reveals more interesting connections between Washington and the beast in Rome. Uh, now listen to this. Uh, let's see. Let me go. It was written by Ben Emerson. And uh, he wrote this. Now remember, this is in a Catholic, uh, this is in a Catholic uh, publication. He says, George Washington, the first president of the United States, served from 1789 to 1797 in that capacity. A popular slogan concerning him was that he was, quote, first in war, first in peace, and first in the hearts of his countrymen. On December 13, 1799, Washington, then age 67, was exposed to a storm of sleet and developed a cold. He rested in bed at his home in Mount Vernon, Virginia. On the morning of the 14th at 3 a.m., he had a severe attack of membrane, membranous croup. At daybreak, Mrs. Washington sent for the only physician, Dr. Craig. Two other phys physicians also came, but all three together could not save him. Washington died between 10 and 11 that night. After four hours before Washington's death, Father Leonard Neal, a Jesuit priest was called to Mount Vernon from St. Mary's Mission across the Piscataway River. Piscataway, that's an interesting river. P-I-S-C-A-T-A-W-A-Y. Piscataway River. Washington had been an Episcopalian. Okay. So why would he want to have a Jesuit priest at his side? Now this is interesting. Uh, Washington had been an Episcopalian, they say. But... 
some and this article says but was baptized into the Roman Catholic Church that night this is in a Catholic website after Washington's death a picture of the Blessed Virgin Mary and one of st. John were found among the effects on an inventory of articles at his home so Washington had an interest in Roman Catholicism for many years his servant Juba stated that the general made the sign of the cross before meals he may have learned this practice from his Catholic lieutenants so he's surrounded by Catholics he has a Jesuit priest come to his bedside um, his lieutenants were John Fitzgerald or Stephen Moylan at Valley Forge Washington had forbidden during Pope's day the burning in effigy of the Roman pontiff Wow sounds to me like he was supporting him just as Trump is now going over to sit with the Pope and the Pope has already been exalted in this country as the top king right when he came over here last year but anyway at Valley Forge what did he do let's see what time so we don't run out here I got four minutes okay good so let me keep this here while I speak so I don't lose my uh, place Washington like I said had an interest in Roman Catholicism for years and he learned this practice from these people I talked about burn didn't allow the burning of the Pope's effigy on Pope's Day see they didn't really like the Catholics back then they like them now but Pope Leo the 13th uh, praised George Washington highly in an encyclical that he wrote on January 6 1893 to the bishops of America he said we highly esteem and love exceedingly the young and vigorous American nation in which we plainly discern latent forces for the advancement alike of civilization and of Christianity there they go mixing themselves with Christians as they always do and isn't it interesting when they were very very when there were few numbers when their numbers were in the minority they praise America now since they're in the majority look what's happening the country's going to hell in a handbasket uh, without morality the state cannot endure a truth that which Ill the illustrious citizens of yours whom we have just mentioned the great Washington with the keenness of insight worthy of a genius and statesman and perceived and proclaimed thanks are due to the equity of the laws which obtain in American customs of a well-ordered Republic for the church amongst you unopposed by the Constitution and the government of your nation fettered by no hostile legislation protected against violence by the common laws and impartiality of tribunals is free to live to act with without hindrance boy do they double speak boy they're good at it Washington was a student of the writings on political philosophy of St. Robert Bellinine and St. Thomas Aquinas. Washington, James Madison, and some of the other founding fathers incorporated into the Constitution in 1787 some of these, quote, saints' ideas about how to set up a republic. In this like manner, let's see, still got about a minute and a half, Thomas Jefferson had studied these saints and incorporated some of their concepts into the Declaration of Independence. A question, therefore, the reader composed to friends as follows. Who was the first man who served as U.S. President? Who was at the time of his death a Roman Catholic? Most people will say John F. Kennedy. But the correct answer, folks, is George Washington, the father of our country quite interesting now I really wish that uh, we get some thoughts on that and I did get an email number of emails regarding when I first started writing about these stories years ago and I'm gonna read one to you from somebody from who was a Dutch listener and I think you'll find it quite interesting also in the second half hour I want to touch on uh, NASA and how the International Space Station is a hoax. It doesn't exist. Just like satellites don't exist. Just like space, as we're told by NASA, doesn't exist. And just like we never went to the moon. Wow. And all that money we give them, what are they doing with it? They're figuring out ways to deceive us. They use it in, you know, they're kind of like, uh, they're getting almost as good as Hollywood when Hollywood does their uh, productions about space aliens. In fact, if you look at Hollywood, it looks better than what NASA presents us. Maybe that's why they work together. 
Back in three minutes on the Investigative Journal. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the Third Temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the Third Temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit Cross the Border org c r o s s cross the border dot org to get your print epub or pdf version of nicholas arthur's new book titled when the third temple is built that's cross the border dot org the program you are listening to is one hundred percent sponsored by you the listener on this first amendment rights media channel you will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. The following, the following program, program is literally dangerous, dangerous and off limits by the supreme, by the supreme Jesuit, Jesuit command. command. But stand tall, people. people. Listen, listen up, up, and, up, and, up, and you, you may, may just, just learn, learn something. something. Okay, we're back for the second half hour of the Investigative Journal on this April 24th, 2017 day on our calendar. And before I get to the uh, topic of the NASA International Space Station, I want to read a comment, an email sent to me uh, years ago when I started talking about uh, the, the Founding Fathers possibly being in the pocket of the Jesuits and the hidden agenda of this country was, uh, you know, basically mastermind by the Jesuit order and the minions working for them. 
And I got much criticism back then. Many people said that I was attacking the Constitution, that I was a communist, that I hated America, etc., etc. And uh, nothing could be farther than the truth. Because I always say this, to understand your country and to be a patriot means to understand how it was formed and the reasons why. Now, on the, on the surface, the Constitution is a, is a great document. In fact, I went to law school, studied constitutional law. But... I also understand that this country is controlled by a very select few for another reason. Sort of the idea that uh, we're being taken over from the enemy within. So someone came to my rescue, and, and it, it really wasn't even one of my American citizen friends. It was someone from a Dutch, a Dutchman. And he said this. He said, Greg is not attacking the Constitution, but wants the truth. I am here because... Meet, I also want my constitution back. That was sabotaged some 200 years ago. I'm not an America, I am Dutch. My constitution was set up by William Silent, who was a former Catholic, just as Greg is a former Catholic. I'm also worried about the American constitution, because I have Sunday law now, while under my legal constitution, the Sabbath was kept. My constitution was sabotaged by the Roman Catholics, to be more precise, by Jan Rutham, who became the Jesuit general as a reward for sabotaging my constitution. I'm very much, I very much doubt whether Greg is interested in and to be rewarded as becoming a Jesuit general. Neither does some other people like John Daniel. After listening to the investigative journal for three years, sacrificing my time, it's like a part-time job. I know what Greg is about, and I also, and also the majority of programs he has done this year uh, on the Tony Alamo ministry, go take your complaint somewhere else, he says to my critics. I'm grateful very much to Greg and have written several articles myself in Dutch to support the Alamo ministries, where I was able to link to Arctic Beacon's Tony Alamo's interviews as reference. My comment on this article is this. The difference between the Dutch Constitution from the 1500s and the American Constitution in the 1700s is huge. And I, at the start, had a hard time understanding why my Constitution would have inspired the American Constitution. The Dutch Constitution would make Roman Catholicism prohibited. The American Constitution did not. Contrary, Roman Catholicism... Catholicism was prohibited in some of the states of the Union, while the American Constitution in 1776 made Roman, <laughs> uh, Roman Catholicism legal in all states. This is an argument in favor of the, of the position Greg takes, because why a constitution of such a constitution would allow us a hostile foreign infiltration? Wow, he's right. That's exactly what I was saying. Our Constitution allowed what Europeans back then knew was a hostile foreign infiltration of our country. And maybe that's why they're allowing this hostile infiltration of all uh, the Muslims coming into America today and in Europe. If you know the connection between Islam and, and the Catholicism. I compare it now back to my email, emailer. He said, I compare it to churches. A Tony Alamo church, when Tony is preaching the truth on the Antichrist, being the Vatican, will, is a great experience to me. Preachers that tell the truth on the Antichrist, I never would hear or see in Holland, where I live. The only European preacher I know is Ian Paisley. I'm a big fan of his sermons of the 1960s. A young but loud voice having no need for a microphone. Also, his media interviews are interesting, where he exposes the lying and cheating of the BBC. BBC is more terrible. It's just like uh, Fox or CNN in America on these issues. Anyway, I'm not interested in a congregation that denies Pontifus Maximus, who is also the end responsible for the killing of Jesus Christ himself. All people know that the Roman Emperor, who was named Pontifus Maximus before the Pope, before the Pope, was created by bribing the Bishop of Rome, would kill the students of Jesus Christ in the Roman circus. As Tony Alamo is persecuted today by the same subject, Pontifus Maximus, the Antichrist system. I uh, thank you, Greg, and way to go. 
and it's a brave path you're taking, he says. Well, thanks for that email, and it uh, probably reflects a lot what's going on today as well. Okay, now, nice little story to get to. Let's start it out by what I mentioned earlier. The ISS space station hoax. Yes, the ISS and pretty much everything else that NASA does is the same. And remember I made this statement, and this is a quote from someone else, and I said I'm going to tell you who. It's this, quote, it's easier to fool people than to convince them that they, are being, that they have been fooled. And that, of course, was said by Mark Twain. Okay, now, here we go. So, the space station is a hoax, and I could go on and on and on, but you can, you know, why don't you spend a weekend Googling all, you know, in your spare time, and start looking at all the, <laughs> a lot of people have spent a lot of time taking a lot of the pictures that NASA has given us and proving that, wow, why are they faking it? If it's real, show us real. And today, when Trump was talking to the woman who supposedly has set a new record, been in space for 532 days, speaking with her on the phone, she's supposed to be a long way away, right? Well, how come there's no delay or anything? Uh, there should be some kind of delay in that kind of phone call, right? Or is that not true? I don't know. But I guess if you're calling her here on Earth or something, uh, if you're calling her, I don't know where they do it. They could be in the airplane that they make. And, and if you look at the space station, it's, it's about the size of an airplane. And um, then they do a lot of their stuff underwater. But what I thought I'd do, instead of me harping on this, I found a nice little clip by Steve Blakely, who looks at the whole picture of NASA. And I'll get through maybe 20 minutes of the 39-minute presentation. But it's actually good to go back and look at what what started this whole thing. Now, it's very interesting that NASA is only a creation uh, since uh, after World War II. But boy, they seem to be the last word about everything. And they are the ones that seem to get all the money. Interesting. Now, the way I got into NASA and realizing it was a hoax was by really investigating the fake moon landing and talking to really guys that have researched and film documentarians uh, that have done a great job. One uh, who did a, probably the best that I've ever seen. A funny thing happened on the way to the moon. And then secondly, astronauts gone wild. And I, uh, Bart, uh, Bart Sabrell, and I interviewed Bart many times. Very interesting. And that was kind of like the last piece of information I needed to basically say this needs to be put on the table and discussed. But let's go and look what Steve Blakely has to say about the hoax of the ISS space station and other things that NASA is deceiving us on. Okay, I like this. Very suspenseful music. I'm watching astronauts bouncing around. Yeah. All right, here we go. After the Second World War, the world, and the United States in particular, had an obsession with space. Space was the final frontier. After the evil empires of Hitler's Third Reich and Japan were defeated, it seemed like the sky was the only fence facing humanity in its progress and destiny. This time of unlimited dreaming of space was epitomized by things like the Jetsons. We were going to have hamburger bars in space. We were going to be flying off to all parts of the solar system. There were going to be hotels in space. We were going to have holidays on the moon and moon bake. German physicist Werner von Braun promised that we would have orbiting space stations. And this seemed to all be coming together during the Apollo moon landings between 1969 and 1972. The potential for space exploration seemed unlimited. It also brought great peril, with the Soviet satellite Sputnik being launched in 1957. Americans feared that the Soviets could launch nuclear weapons into their homeland. President Eisenhower was fully aware of the US Army's experiments on rockets that went into high altitude and into orbit, and that they were completely unsuccessful and came back a charred mess. 
but to the public, Sputnik seemed like a real threat. Eisenhower correctly assessed it as just being a tin can with a radio transmitter, but the US public saw this as the dawning of a new and frightening space age where the Soviets could easily launch their deadly nuclear weapons from the center of Russia to the center of America. This documentary tries to show that Eisenhower was correct in his assessment. Sputnik was no trouble at all, and intercontinental ballistic missiles never came to be due to unsolved problems of re-entry. A senator from Massachusetts, John Kennedy, portrayed Eisenhower as being an old fuddy-duddy who was behind the times and asleep at the wheel, even though this was a completely unfair assessment. The only missile gap was in the minds of the American public with respect to what ICBM technology could really achieve. Supposedly, the Soviets had working intercontinental ballistic missiles with atomic warheads by the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962. Well, then, why did that crisis happen at all? Why should President Kennedy care where Khrushchev deployed his nuclear missiles, whether it was just off the coast in Cuba or launched by supposed space-going intercontinental ballistic missiles from the center of the Soviet Union? It's because... True space-going ICBMs aren't possible, and this documentary explains why, and why the Cuban Missile Crisis was a threat. It's because only short-range nuclear missiles are possible. That's why putting them with such close proximity in Cuba was considered a danger by President Kennedy. Things seemed to finally be coming together with the moon landing. We were there on the surface of another planet. You could see it on TV. Well, first it was projected onto a silver screen and then the TV cameras were allowed to film off the silver screen because obviously you wouldn't want the real footage. I mean, if you want to go back and look at the real footage of the initial moon landing, you can't because it's been taped over by NASA and no one was fired, no one was punished. Of course, they want to get rid of the evidence. Now, at this stage, a band of Apollo faithful will be howling in protest, we did go to the moon. Then why did nothing come of it? Why have we not been back in 40 years? The Apollo faithful will say, oh, it's budget priorities, we've been there, we've done that, it's not economical to mine on the moon. That just doesn't hold water, that's a load of rubbish. We haven't been back to the moon because we never went there in the first place. In the year 1994, I read a book by Ralph Rene, which suggested just such a thing, that the entire moon landing had been a hoax. This is the reason why we don't have a moon base now, why we aren't mining on the moon. Werner von Braun promised a moon base by the 1980s. We don't have that. We have nothing in space, virtually nothing. There's the space shuttle, which does low Earth orbit, and there's some rockets that go up in the International Space Station. Supposedly they repair the Hubble telescope through spacewalks. Aside from that, though, we don't go anywhere in the solar system. There's no Jetsons future. There's no dawning of a space age for humanity where we can jet off to all points of the solar system whenever we want. Nothing happened. The moon landing stopped in 1972, and we haven't been back. We haven't been beyond the Van Allen belts which many have pointed out have deadly radiation that living creatures can't survive, not even a tortoise or a cockroach, let alone a human being. In Ralph Rene's NASA Moon to America, he pointed out that physicist James Van Allen was the first one to discover that space had deadly nuclear radiation flying around all over the place. Not only were the Van Allen radiation belts deadly, which are like two orbiting Tauruses of nuclear radiation around the Earth, but later we found there were galactic cosmic rays, which were deadly, and when the sun is having solar flares, there's deadly radiation as well. There's three different sources of deadly radiation, and all of these very likely would have fried the astronauts if they went to the moon. So we're stuck here on Earth, at least as far as low Earth orbit goes. Well, at least that's what I had assumed until a few months ago, I'm looking at the picture of the Apollo entry vehicle and thinking, this truncated cone is not going to be stable in flight. This is going to roll over and over again. The top, the sides, the window are all going to be exposed to the huge heat in the direction of travel. They would tumble and roll out of control and mix up the astronauts inside, possibly injuring them or knocking them out with excessive G-forces. 
So while I had long suspected that the moon landing was fake, I had assumed that low Earth orbit was real and that the International Space Station was true. But my research of the last year has led me to the conclusion that not even low Earth orbit is possible, that the International Space Station is a hoax, and all manned space travel is fake. The main reason I believe all manned space travel is fake is because the re-entry vehicles are fake. I'll go through all of that in detail. First though, let's have a look at the International Space Station. I want to talk about some of the anomalies I see there. For the inside of the International Space Station, there are a couple of zero-gravity tricks that they use to fake it. The first is they have a complete mock-up of the International Space Station built on the inside of an airplane. And that airplane does a bunch of rises and falls. It does a parabolic, upside-down parabolic trajectory, and that simulates zero gravity. For traditionally about 30 seconds at the most, I think they can do it to about 45 seconds, judging by the length of time of these segments. They have to do a hard break, or they have to put the camera to the wall or away from a person, or they can link scenes together. They're quite clever in the CGI. It's difficult to tell all of their tricks. The other main way they simulate the zero gravity is with suspension in front of a blue screen. And they use that trick for extended periods of time, for longer than 45 second segments. But they can't move around as much. They can't do the acrobatic flips and rolls in the extended mode. So there's full motion mode where they can fully move around and that's faked in a plane and then there's suspended or extended mode where they're suspended by wires in front of a blue screen. They don't move around as much but they can make the scene last for a longer period of time. In this scene Chris Hadfield bends down in order to adjust something and you can see on the back of his shirt a couple of upticks on either side where you would expect wires to come in on either side of that harness in order to support it. Of course, they've computer graphicked out the supporting wires. You can't actually see them. But what you can see is a very slight discoloration where it's slightly lighter and then it goes slightly darker. And that's strange. That shows a couple of things. First of all, it shows that this isn't live from space. They're often portraying that this is live of course, these things are fully choreographed and edited in advance to make sure that there's nothing too obvious that you can see that gives away that this is a suspension in front of a blue screen hoax. The other thing it shows is that this is not raw footage coming to us. This is edited stuff. This is supposed to be a legitimate space program. This is supposed to be the International Space Station, and we should be able to see whatever's going on. But they edit things because the whole thing is edited. In one extended mode scene, Chris Hadfield on the right is going back, he's going back, 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 and then he just stops. That's an odd motion. You would expect if this was true zero gravity that you have to support yourself, you have to stop yourself on both the top and the bottom of your body as you're drifting back. If you just stop yourself with your feet, then your head will rotate backwards. Conversely, if you just hang on at the top with your hands, then your feet will still keep moving. You have to support... Okay, if you want to see what he's talking about, I just want to add this for you. You can just Google a video called ISS Space Station Hoax. Yes, the ISS and pretty much everything else to do with NASA. ...yourself at the, both the top and the bottom of your body, but his hands, Chris Hadfield's hands, aren't touching anything. He just goes back and then he stops. And that's odd. You can see a sort of a harness sticking through the t-shirt of Chris Hadfield. It's a harness that's around the waist. That's how they're supported. Also notice that Chris Hadfield has the habit of bringing his knees up. That's because his stomach muscles aren't as strong. He doesn't have as much midriff strength as some of the others who are able to elongate their body and make the hoax look a bit more realistic. He's constantly bringing his knees up because he's not as strong as the others. Occasionally, though, the others bring their knees up too. Notice that in the extended scenes, which seems to be done in front of a blue screen, like if you have a look at this guy going back towards the screen, there's some strange shadows there 
look like they're CGI'd in. Using computer graphics, they edit out the supporting wires and edit in these rotating floating objects. They always seem very concerned with the object. Chris Hadfield looks at it very closely. You don't want the object getting too far out of control because if it starts bouncing off the cabin in a weird way or goes back to the blue screen, it could ruin the whole illusion. They also don't bounce those oranges off the walls. I'd like to see them get a tennis ball and throw it around really hard and fast. And I'd like to see them do -si do each other really quickly, which they can't do, or they'd get all their wires tangled up. Here's another scene with Catherine Katie Coleman. Seems to be done in the suspended mode. Have a look at her hair. There's something odd about her hair. I know this is zero gravity and hair is supposed to stick out and go all over the place, but her hair doesn't really flop around naturally. It's always sticking out kind of rigidly. Maybe they permed it in that position, or perhaps they're hanging her upside down. As she shakes her head from side to side slightly, you can see the hair always springs back to a particular position with respect to her head. It should flop all over the place. The chain that she's wearing around her neck is a computer graphic. This is computer-generated images. Japan, and that brings us to Koichi, who's in the Japanese lab Kibo. So Koichi, walk me through what you're working on in this lab. Yeah, this is an experiment called Spheres. Uh, and these uh, satellite robots are specifically designed to function in the microgravity. They contain the software that the scientists are testing. At first, this looks like a full motion scene to me, but on closer inspection, I think this is a suspended mode scene. When, this, when it's sped up, you can kind of see them swinging, and it has the same backdrop as the other suspended mode scenes. And then there's this weird part. Rick Mastracchio puts out his hand and he moves forward. Maybe he's using his feet to wedge himself forward somehow, but it doesn't look like it. The floor is smooth. His foot is behind that blue handle that's attached to the floor that he keeps both of his feet under and keeps shuffling back and forth on. He sticks his left hand out and then he just moves forward. He is Superman. That's how Superman moves forward. He sticks out his arm and he flies. Okay, you know something? The picture tells a thousand words, doesn't it? And you know, all you do, just Google this and you'll start seeing some of, uh, I've, I've spent hours searching, you know, how they do things underwater. You've seen bubbles. You've seen them uh, make mistakes showing a scuba tank. And uh, if it was all real, none of this would happen. So the question is, why? Why do they deceive us so? Well, you figure that out because they've deceived us about the moon landing. They've deceived us about NASA. They've deceived us how our country was formed. So why wouldn't they deceive us regarding the true size and shape of the Earth and what Antarctica really is all about? Just some questions. Back tomorrow on The Investigative Journal. The Book of Revelation says, The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app for all of your mobile devices. Streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, and smartphone absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today so you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The Prophecy Since the beginning of time, kings have sought it, nations have fought for it, it has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased, it has been stolen, there's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, Invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. 
or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188. 